Hello, yes, that's right. It's Joe here live for Joyrider TV, back with some more Q and A from Joyrider TV, where I am going to be attempting to answer all of your most challenging catamaran sailing questions. Oh, yes. Hello to everybody who's already with us live and hello to everybody who's not already with us live, but look, but watching later on. It's great to have you all here with us. If you are watching this later on, not live, and you have got any qu uh, questions that you'd like answering in the topic of catamaran sailing, then please do put any questions in the comments section below and I will do what I can to answer those in next week's Q&A as part of the preloaded questions section. Just having a little shuffle there. Okay, so biggest news from my department, Justin, is that I have spent pretty much the last two days doing nothing other than editing the next episode of Show Us Your Cat. Yes, that's right. Show Us Your Cat is coming back to Joyrider TV. It will be going out at eight o'clock Greek time on Sunday, which will be seven o'clock Central European time. Um, I suppose that would make it six o'clock UK time. And I suppose that would make it um, about lunchtime in the USA, depending on what time your lunch is. Um, but this episode of Show Us Your Cat, it has got one of the most jaw-dropping features I have ever seen. Um, and um, I'll even use that on the thumbnail so you'll get a bit of that flavour before you've even switched it on. Um, yeah, so there we go. That is coming up on Sunday. All right. So hello to everybody who's checking in. Hello to Benny um, and Declan in Sweden. Uh, good to have uh, Sweden on board. Hope the snow is uh, is uh, treating you well. Hello to ABR19096 from Slower and Lower Delaware. Great stuff where the president resides. Nice to know. I'm interested in sail trim and repairs to, to the 14 foot waves I have in my sailing school. Uh -huh. Yeah. If you have got a um, specific question, then uh, then fire away and I'll see what I can do. Um, so it looks like already in the live chat, there's been some discussion going on on the topic of how do you find out where water has been getting into your boat so abr19096 has got some very good advice here which is you he um his method is he gets a vacuum cleaner but with it set to blow and you put that a few inches from the drain plug where the bung goes in and then spray any suspect spots with Windex uh, or any sort of soapy water, I'm sure would do the same. And you just look for where the air is coming out of the hull. He does mention that um, he takes care not to over pressurize the hull, which could actually cause a bit of damage there so um that is a very good tip do be aware that the place where your boat might be leaking and it's quite a common place for a boat to leak is actually the drain plugs so if your drain plug the bung if the thread on the drain plug is worn then that might not be sealing quite as well as it once did and if you consider that the drain plug is a part of the hull that is constantly under the water, then um, the bit of detective work might suggest 
that that is quite a strong um, possible culprit of where your boat is leaking. And if it's not actually the drain plug itself, maybe your drain plug or bung doesn't have a seal on it. So it should have a rubber seal going around it as well. If it hasn't got a rubber seal or if your rubber seal looks pretty ropey, um, well worth uh, sticking a new rubber seal on. And then the actual bung housing itself, uh, there might be air or sorry, water getting in there. So maybe it's worth as a first point of call, if you're going to be working on your boat, just unscrew your bung housing, take it out, scrape off the old sealant, um, like I said for last week, for um, removing old grip. The best thing I find for scraping anything off your hulls is a Stanley knife blade, which sorry, you can then use as a scraper. And it does a really great job in getting stuff off the hulls. And then put some new, some fresh new sealant on there. I use um, Sikaflex. I can't remember what the number is that I use, but it's the one which is called Marine Sealant Adhesive. That works really, really well. Put some of that on. Use a rubber glove if you don't want to have um, sealant on your fingers for the rest of the day. Screw the bung housings back in, and then you will know that at least it's not your bung housings where your boat is leaking. Um, but um, the pressure testing is a great idea. Same thing goes for if you've got water uh, getting into your mast as well on your boat. You could, um, you're going to need to drain your mast if there is water inside. So if you are draining your mast, the easiest way to drain it is to drill out one of the sacrificial rivets, which would be in the bottom of the mast towards the bottom. What you'll find um, is on a lot of masts, there's the bottom, then you've got fittings like here or here. And then so up here somewhere, there'd be two rivets that don't appear to do anything. Um, if you drill those two rivets out, be careful not to make the holes any bigger. Um, but get those rivets out because you need a second hole when you are draining the um, mast to let the air go into the mast. Otherwise, there'll be a vacuum and the water won't come out. Um, that's actually... Another thing with water in your hulls, if you sail a boat which doesn't have hatch covers uh, like a Hobie 16, then it is quite difficult to get the water to come out of the hulls because when it's draining, it will cause a vacuum because there's nowhere for the water to get in because the water is blocking the, uh, the drain plug hole so the water can't get in. So you need to put in like a long straw, thin straw to let the water, to let the air get in so the water can get out. But like with the mast, cover all the, once you've drained it, um, fill one of these sacrificial rivet holes. And then what you can do is make a custom nozzle, like even out of a, um, you know, out of a bit of the biro, you could make a custom nozzle out of there, which slots in to the rivet hole in the mast, then put a pump on there, having covered all of your fittings in um, soapy water, pump the mast up. It won't take much with the mast and see where the bubbles are coming out. And that will suggest to you where the air is getting in. Um, and then if you have got rivets that are letting the air in, best thing to do is just put a little dab of epoxy on all of those rivets and then leave that to set, then do the, repeat the process and check to see if that has worked. So that's what I reckon there. All right.
So who else is checking in? Sorry, just looking at the live chat. Um, all right, so ABL 919096 says, um, because I think he's using Hobie Waves, my plugs thread straight into the holes and have been shredded. Um, yeah, so in a lot of the um, roto molded boats, like the Getaway or the Wave or something like the uh, Dart 16, um, the bung might thread directly into the hull, which means that thread is going to be a lot more vulnerable than one you can replace. So ABR says, I put Shikom Red Ring Ronstan plugs in with Loctine, Loctite Marine Urophane to bond the receiver. Um, so you actually glue the um, the bungs in. Is that what I'm detecting from you there? If you've got hatches, that does seem like a good plan if your threads have already gone a bit there. All right, we have got Leland Lee on board in Clearwater, Florida. Nice to have you with us, Lee, as always. Um, all right. Also, uh, yeah, Lee says, uh, slightly windy but sunny. Going to send tomorrow. Nice. Yeah, good luck to anybody who's going out on the send. If you are going out on the send, then um, why not get on the global speed stick? Yes. All you need to get on the global speed stick is you can use your telephone, um, not the landline, but the mobile phone more likely. Get it in some sort of dry bag and then just run an app um, which tells you how fast you've gone afterwards. Then send me the results. Get on the stick. Um, if you're doing if you're going out on any type of catamaran or any type of sailing boat, in fact, and if you're hitting as much as 15 knots, whew, get on the stick. Um, and then, you know, there we go. All right. So, uh, um, ABR says you may get away with silicon lube um, and replacing the O-ring. I think the original manufacturer was O-ring. 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 All right. Just reading what's written. Okay, so in Stockholm, it's rainy and cold. Two degrees. Ouch. Uh, we've got Jill on board in Tampa, Florida. Great to have you with us, Jill. Uh, we've got channel member Russell that had an announcement that you've been a channel member now, Russell, for two months. So great to have you on board. Um, and we've got Mark and Janet in Ohio on board. Um, ABR, as far as I know, the comments are not turned off. In the live chat is certainly turned on. But I think the actual comment section of the video uh, doesn't become available, as far as I know, until after the live has finished. I think that's how it works. So during the live, you can only get involved in the live chat. But then after, you can get involved in the comment section. Oh, there we go. Declan just said the same thing. All right. Uh, so for your sealant, ABR says 241 Sikaflex, which cures quickly. So it does mean that you could get out on the water shortly after performing that small operation. All right. Mark says, I have an opportunity ha, 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 to purchase a 1990 Tornado sailcraft. It's been stored in a barn for 30 years. We'll be going to take a look, but want to know what to look for. It's only $1,200. So very tempting. Yeah, most, um, to be honest, most tornadoes um, are so well built um, because they, a lot of them were specifically built to campaign for the Olympic Games uh, back then. Uh, the, the holes, it sounds like the holes on that bad boy should be pretty mint. Um, like with any type of boat, we would look for any soft spots on the holes. 
but I would think that um, it's unlikely to have that going on, um, it being a tornado. Uh, my boat is a little bit younger than that. It's a 99 tornado, and the hulls are still as stiff as the day it was built. Not that I knew it the day that it was built, but I'm guessing that it's just as stiff now as it ever was. So um, holes to look at. And other, everything is pretty much standard across all types of catamaran. So what I would look at is next thing that's going to cost you a lot. This isn't one that I mention too often, but I've just um, been thinking about this myself, is take a good look at the front beam, especially. Now you've got the dolphin striker that comes down there. And just check, especially in this area here, for any cracking or um, what would you call it? Like. Um, if the aluminium has been degrading in that area, because this area needs to be good because that takes a lot of the strain of what's going on on the boat, but have fatigue. Thank you, Declan for um, helping me with my English. Um, yeah. So check out there, check out everything on the beams because beams on a boat, like beams on any boat to replace going to be expensive but um, you don't want any little hidden treats when you get that bad boy home. Take a good look at the rudder system. Um, and then everything else is just very standard. Like take a look at uh, the trampoline, the sails, and hopefully if it's been stored in a barn for 30 years, as long as the trampoline and sails haven't been eaten by mice or moths or any other sort of um, animals or insects, then in theory, they should be okay. Um, you're probably going to want to replace the rigging because you don't want to have any um, surprises happen when a shroud fails or something. So allow for about, I don't know, $200 for a new pair of shrouds and uh, forestay. And um, yeah, I think... This sounds amazing. I'm really interested to um, see what you find there, Mark. Um, so do feel free to send me some photographs when um, you go and have a look at that bad boy. Okay. So um, Lee says, follow up from last from a question in last week's Q&A about the whole wiggle in the castings, any particular adhesive to use, I plan to glue them together in the future. Yeah, um, what I am um, going to do, and I've been getting some advice on this myself, because um, you're not going to believe it, but having now retired from Wild Wind Sailing Holidays, I have found myself a Hobie 16 of my own and um, I'm going to glue it. I'm not going to glue it together, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, basically make some epoxy. What would you call them? Epoxy bushes that go between the pylons and the castings. So with the advice that I've been given so far, what I'm thinking to do is, firstly, I'll clean the pylons and the bushes, uh, not the bushes, the castings completely. So if you're not sure about what I'm talking about, anybody else is. It's time for that picture of machete. Uh, not my best, but if this is the Hobie 16 hole, these bits are the pylons. And then we've got the castings, which slot over the top to build that raised trampoline section on there. So we're going to start off by cleaning up the inside of the castings 
and the outside of the pylons. So once it's clean, going to use some sandpaper in there um, to uh, to clean that up. And then once I've done that, I'm going to do a bit more research on this, but going to get some sort of release wax or something to put inside the castings. Um, and then with release wax in place on there, I will then um, mix up some epoxy paste, which we've talked about before, and uh, get a liberal amount of there on the outside of the pylons, stick it all together. And then um, what I'm thinking is like you would do normally with grease when you're saddling the casting onto the pylon to use a stick or a screwdriver or something to make sure you've located the holes uh, which go through it all to make sure you have got them in the right place. Then get the bolts in and um, let, let it all dry. And then I'm not going to take it apart until it's time to take it apart. But apparently by heating it up a bit later on, and then applying a liberal amount of pressure, which we are actually going to look at in one of our preloaded questions later on, then maybe it will be um, possible to get that bad boy apart again. Yeah, so that's what I'm thinking to stiffen up my boat to make it like new. And of course, I'm going to document that process. But perhaps, like I see Steve has um, said in the live chat, um, what about the beer can method seems a bit easier. Yeah, maybe I'll try some of these other methods first with using a bit of um, some aluminium shoved up there to as a, um, a shim to take that space out of uh, this joint here. Either some beer can or some plastic uh, material in there first. So that is what I'm planning. So when you say what particular adhesive to use, I'm going to be using some West epoxy um, with some micro bubbles in there to make it into more of a thick paste and then shoving it up there and off we go. That is what I'm thinking. OK, so we've got Mr. Tony KP on board. Hello from Denmark. Great to have you with us as always. Um, all right. So Declan says, oh, this is good to know. The tornado had a number of changes in 93. So bear that in mind when looking for parts. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, my knowledge of the changes in the tornado are not actually that good of when they came about. Like when um, uh, the boat having a spinnaker as standard became standard, I would think in maybe in 1990, it was still uh, the classic tornado was getting sailed. Uh, answers on a postcard, please. Anybody who knows. Um, was it still the classic tornado as it's known in 1990 or had it already moved on to being uh, the tornado with the square top mainsail, batten jib and uh, double trapeze. There we go. All right. ABR says my trampolines get damaged from people cutting bait or using them for their barbecue. Now, that is a problem. Um yeah, there's no real solution to that. If you have your boat parked on um, a fairly public beach, then people are going to do things on your trampoline. We know this from experience here on the Wild Wind Beach in Vasiliki, Greece. People do things. Um, yeah, the only thing you could do is to find an inexpensive um, way to... Uh, if you've got that many boats to put an inexpensive cover over the trampolines in the long run, if it stops your trampolines getting soiled or um, 
stops them getting too much any UV damage, then um, that could help. All right, just scrolling through. There's a lot of chat in the live chat today, but um, not so many questions. All right, so for um, taking the boat, so for when I was saying about using wax to let it release, Declan says, how about using peel ply instead of wax so that you can get it apart. But then ABR says peel ply is lumpy. I would use polyphene from a winterizing jug. All right, plenty of ideas there. Uh, Miguel says, uh, how about you unmount the trampoline in the winter? Yeah, so that is definitely what I would do if you're leaving your boat for a long period of time. Like, I would think even if you were going to leave it in the summer, for six weeks, I would take everything off the boat that you possibly can because you want your boat to still be a boat when you get back to it. So take off the trampoline, take the rudders off, take any ropes off the boat that you can, perhaps drop the mast as well um, so that it's all peace of mind. But of course, if you're dropping the mast, you need to leave it in such a way that people aren't either going to run it over with their car or have accidents walking into it that sort of thing all right so i think at this stage in the game i'm gonna beam in with the first of the preloaded questions and i think that everyone's gonna like this one this oh actually before the preloaded questions for those of you in europe um, or France especially, uh, there is an opportunity to buy a boat. Yes, someone's got in touch. Uh, it's Emile, who has previously been featured with this boat in Show Us Your Cat episode 96. He's selling his Hobie 17. Oh, yeah. Um, it's located in Brittany in France. Um, it comes with a set of Mylar sails, very good condition. Just the sails are worth 1,700 euros. Oh, yes, they are. Um, it's got a Mylar jib with a roller furler. It's got a 21 square meter asymmetric spin spinnaker, which I would say on a Hobie 17, that is massive. That is going to absolutely pull that boat like it's been dragged along by something very powerful. Um, it's got a two uh, twin wheel uh, launching trolley from Hobie Cat, and it's got a canvas cover to protect the trampoline from uh, people wanting to do things on your trampoline. Um, Emil continues, in 2020, the, the catamaran underwent a complete restoration with meticulous attention to detail. Yes, it did. The holes were stripped down. The gel coat on the hull bottoms were redone. A two-component epoxy primer was applied, and then everything was lack lacquered for a flawless finish. Not easy to say. Um, this catamaran has only sailed one, sin one season since the... Uh, restoration, meaning it's ready to conquer the waves with you for many seasons to come. The price, €2,500. Seems very reasonable. And from what Emil has said, it really does sound like that boat doesn't need any money spending on it at all. So that is £2,500, ready to go, Brittany, France. Um, I think you could probably even come up with some sort of half delivery scheme if you are like for example if you're in germany you could meet halfway um but sounds like a very good uh good scheme there so thanks emil for sharing that check out show us your cat episode 96 
um, if you would like to have a look at that boat. All right, so we have, yeah, this is actually something that I did think. Um, ABR says, I worry about using uh, metal can shims in this cavity here because of gal galvanic corrosion. So where the metal is reacting to the other metal and making it corrode in a horrible way. Could that be a thing? Yeah. So that's why I've always sort of suggested the plastic rather than the metal. The other thing with the metal is it could end up being quite a hazard if it isn't fitted perfectly. And if you've got a little lip of metal can sticking out here, that could be quite sharp. Hmm. Yeah. So um, hello to Aaron in New Zealand, channel member. Uh, first thing in the morning there. Uh, thanks for tuning in. I uh, hope this being half an hour later has made it slightly easier for you. Although I can't imagine that much um, easier, but a bit easier anyway. All right. So um, next preloaded question. This comes from Mac. This was a question on Instagram, no less. Yes, I am modern enough to know what Instagram is. So check out Total Joyrider on Instagram. Um, all right, he says, um, I have two Hobie 14s and I want to swap the frame. So that would be all of the beams um, from one boat to another. I've tried to get the frames off the boat but they absolutely aren't budging. Any tips? Thanks. Yeah, so the thing with the um, Hobie 14 is once it's, well, because it's a much smaller boat than the 16, it is so much more difficult to get it together in the first place. The 14 that we've got on the beach here, this was brand new in, in the year 2000. And it hasn't been taken apart since then. And I don't think it ever will be. Because when we built it the first time, it was an absolute effort to get it together. Because it's so tight, it being that much smaller, it means there's that much less sort of flex um, between the whole thing. So to get the boat apart, what I would suggest, this is a method that I've used many times. First part of the method is what I call giving it a bit of Turkish. And this is, we're just gonna manipulate it slightly. So if this is our boat here, you get one person on this bow, one person on this bow, And one person pushes down on the bow while the other person just pulls it up a bit. So you're deliberately twisting the boat a little bit. And what that should do is break anywhere where, not like break, destroy, but what might have happened is inside where, the, where it all connects together, it might have just seized up over time. And if you can just get whatever is seized together just to split, then that means the boat should come apart. So if this chap does a bit of lifting and then he goes to pushing down, this chap does a bit of lifting and then the standard technique is to stand here with your rubber mallet and you hit underneath that corner of the casting upwards and then give it a fairly good whack in there, like a good 10 whacks in there. And then if it isn't moving, um, then perhaps repeat process one and uh, do that process like three times 
give it a bit of Turkish, then hit it both sides. If the back beam will come off already, just take that off first so that then that's done and that's not going to be restricting the process, the progress with the front beam. Um, and then after you've repeated that a couple of times, you should have a bit of a, a line that you can check on your pylon. So if this is the pylon and then this is the casting here, um, if you can see after you've hit it, it might not feel like it's moved, but you might see a bit of a line there, which is a clue that it has moved a bit. Then you can just com um, continue hitting it. And then it will event eventually, if it starts moving, then it will come off. Now, if none of that works, this is what works for me. I really have tried absolutely everything um, because I've been doing this a very long time. And this is what always works. Is if you can get the back beam off, if, if that is possible, do that. Even if you can get one of the ends of the front beam off, do that as well. And then we're going to put the boat upside down. Um, how do we draw an upside down boat? Sort of like that. There's our um, affected area. And then what we'll do is we'll put one end of the boat. If, if you're in a, if you've got grass on the floor, that's great. But if it's, if it's like a stone floor, then you want to make sure that the bit of the boat which is down is on something fairly kind, like a boat cover or something. And then put the other end of the boat raised off the floor enough so that you've got some clearance here. Sorry, I didn't draw it quite as well as I might have done, but you get the idea. So what I would perhaps use here is a good bench or a um a trestle with something soft on there just to make sure we're not going to damage the boat so maybe like a foam block on a trestle where the boat will rest and then this is what we get this is what i do and this is what always works is we take a big lump of wood hold on have i got so I know how big the lump of wood is that I use. It is, what would that be? Yeah, it'd be about an eight or nine inch square section lump of wood, which is about a meter long. So it's really got some weight to it. Um, and then lump of wood sits, it will be, be at a slight angle, sits up against the bottom of the um what you call that the casting with somebody holding it and then the second person two ways you could do this you could have the lump of wood like that and then someone hits um this end of the lump of wood with a sledgehammer the boat doesn't um resist to that very much but what i generally end up doing is actually using the lump of wood as the hammer, maybe put um, some tape up against the gunnel of the boat so you don't scratch the boat with the wood. And it is pretty brutal, but that is the only thing that I have found never fails. There we go. Sorry if that was a little bit painful to listen to um, with big lump of wood whacking your boat with it. But if your boat won't come apart, the boat will succumb to the big lump of wood. There we go. All right. So in the live chat. Um, all right. We've got Jens on board. Hello, Jens. Good to see you, too. Hope you're having a good time. I hope it's all going well in Germany. 
do you want to buy a Hobie 17? That is the big question. Um, I don't don't know if the Hobie 17 would suit you so well. Um, if you don't know about the classic Hobie 17, it was, um, I believe it came from Hobie Cat after the Hobie 18 classic. So a kind of similar shape to it as the Hobie 18, but with much less volume. Originally designed as a single hander, but like with many single handers, it was made um, so that you could sail it with two people by adding a jib. And um, then on the 17, it wasn't so much commonplace to add a second set of trapeze wires because it comes as standard with the picnic bench style uh, wings. Uh, so there we go. Very nice boat, though. Very good to sail as a single hander, that's for sure. Or as a double hander for a fairly low, lightweight team. Like if you're coming in at, let's say, at 150 or less, then it would be a good double hander, the Hobie, um, the Hobie 17. All right. Hello to ah, Sun God competition winner, ANT Paskov. Great to have you on board. Have you received those bad boys yet? And let us know how you are finding them. I think, you know, to, to win a set of sunglasses is nice, but to win a pair of custom-made, very high-quality sunglasses, now that is special. All right. So uh, we've got also in the live chat, hello to Pierre Luigi. Are you in left Carter at the moment? Yes, I am. Um, yes. So I actually live on the island. And um, even though I'm not going to be working on the Warwin Beach anymore, I'm uh, with my family living on the island of left Carter. And that is where we plan to stay. Do you stay there till then? Yes, I do. Um, yeah, this is where we're going to stay because it's really nice and I like it very much. All right, so Benny in Sweden says, any advice on DIY wings to a Hobie 18? I remember seeing it on an episode of Show Us Your Cat. Yes, um, the chap in question who made that set of wings on Show Us Your Cat, his name is Vic, um, and he sails out of St. Catherine's Multi-Hole Club in Canada. That is all I could tell you. Um, so, um, but the actual building of DIY wings, yeah, that's a, a trick shot that I'm not ready for just yet, I think. Um, yeah, I know what you're saying, though, Benny, because to find a set of wings um, for a Hobie 18, these were called Magnum wings, by the way. Um, the ones which were, so that is like Magnum PI. Magnum. Uh, Magnum wings. Yeah, difficult to find secondhand. And if you can find a secondhand pair of Magnum wings, there's a chance they're going to be pretty expensive. So I really can see the appeal of building your own, but I couldn't um, really suggest how you would go about doing that at this time. But Vic from St. Catherine's Multi-Hole Club, um, maybe that's in uh, Toronto, just guessing Canada. Um, he is the guy who has made the wings. So um, yeah, if I remember, I'll try to dig out that episode later on. But um, if you look at Show Us Your Cat, put in a search for Show Us Your Cat Canada, then it'll probably even be in the thumbnail, um, something with wings that wouldn't normally have wings. All right, so what else have we got in the live chat? Declan says, uh, research on aluminium corrosion. All right, so he, uh, having done some research, Declan says it is okay to use beer cans and the castings, because the two types of aluminium should not react. There we go. Uh, got Phil on board. Um, any updates? Oh, it's one shoe, Phil. 
Hi, Phil. Great stuff. Great to have you with us. Any updates with the record? No. Um, to be honest, I haven't checked in my junk mail folder. Maybe I should do um, to see if Guinness Book of Records have come back. I'm actually looking at this on a set computer number two. Uh, Guinness. All right, you're hearing you're hearing this live. Actually, I've just it's gone into the junk mail. Um, I've just found it. Thanks for pointing this out. We are pleased to inform you that your record application for the fastest speed on a Hobie Cat has been received, and you do not need to do anything further at this stage. We have attached the terms and conditions of record breaking, which we advise to read carefully. You can view your application via the website at blah, 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 blah. Um, at Guinness World Records, we take care to evaluate, evaluate every application we receive before we accept or reject a new record proposal. We always carry out specific research which can require the expertise of external consultants, which might, of course, be that guy, Joe, um, at Joyrider TV. Um, blah, 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 blah. There we go. So, yes, the, the wheels are in motion um, to getting a fastest ever speed on a Hobie Cat. Um, record to go into the Guinness Book of World Records. If um, you didn't know earlier on, um, myself and one shoe Phil, who's there in the, I'm pretty sure that is one shoe Phil in the live chat. Um, we went out and we hit 26.15 knots on a Hobie 16. And that speed was recorded by three different uh, GPS devices which made me feel if you've got that much evidence to support your claim, then perhaps it is worthy of going in the big book. So I got in touch with the Guinness Book of World Records and there they are in my junk mail, just got back to me. So uh, there we go, exciting times perhaps. All right. So um, back to corrosion of sticky metal up your uh, up your casting. Ooh, sounds a bit, uh, might, it might tickle a bit. Um, the corrosion issue will come from crevice corrosion before galvanic kicks in. So filling any gap is priority, which is why the epoxy route would be better, particularly in salty environments. Thanks for that, Declan. I think I'm going to stick to, I'll go first with plastic and then second with epoxy. Um, all right. So ANT Pascoff, winner of the Sun God giveaway, said the package has arrived. The glasses are excellent, especially the lenses. Great. Glad to hear that. Glad to hear that you like them. Um, if you want to get yourself, have I got any here? No, they're in a different room. Um a set of Sun God sunglasses, then do check out uh, the link that you'll find in any of the videos. Um, head over there, customize your own. You can even get prescription sunglasses, um, which I've had a look at that. And they're pretty much, this doesn't actually seem like it could be real, but I think it is the same price as non-prescription. How can that be right? Hmm. All right. I've got Mike on board. Hello, Mike. Great to have you with us. Uh, recently had to replace the boom on my Hobie 17, and all I could find was one off a Hobie 18. Pins fine to the mast and is five inches longer than the 17 boom, so I think it will work out any problems you can foresee. Um, yeah, the only difference, if you're putting a boom from a different boat on a different boat, is going to be if you're using the bracket 
where the main sheet attaches off your replacement boom. So if this is the mast, this is the boom, there's the trampoline. Boom's quite long. So if it's got a longer boom, then I would guess the bracket where the main sheet attaches would be further back. This is an exaggeration, of course, which might put the main sheet at a funny angle. See where I'm going with this. Um, which the first thing that would mean is if your main sheet is going at quite a big angle like this, your cleating angle is going to go up quite high. So it's going to be almost impossible to cleat your main sheet. But also the leverage here you're going to be getting is going to be different to if it was going um, straight up like it would be normally, like, like here where, where it kind of should be. And this is also going to mean that it's going to use more rope as well because this distance is going to be greater than this distance here. How can we get around this issue? The easiest way is to make yourself a strop. Uh, it's what we do here at Wild Wind Sailing Holidays. Um, if this is the mainsail, comes down here. Here's the clue of the mainsail. What we do, using all the colours today, thank you, um, is with some rope, I'd actually use two different bits of, um, you could just use one, but um, on my boat, this is what I use on the tornado as well. I have one rope strop that goes round the boom and holds the boom nice and tight to the sail. And then I use a second one, which is a bit longer, which the main sheet can then attach onto. You can then attach the outhaul to the sail thus. Um, and by having a slightly longer strop there, it's got the, uh, the bonus of you can set the length of that strop so that when you've sheeted in maximum, which to, to um, what would you call it, to um, investigate sheeting in maximum, what I would do is stand on the beach, pull the main sheet in as hard as you can with both hands, and that is the most you're ever going to sheet in. If the blocks don't come together completely, then that means you haven't made this strop too long. And it means you will not need as much rope on your main sheet, which is good because that means there's less rope that's going to get um, washed overboard um, when you're trapezing or off the back of the boat if there's waves. So less main sheet is always good. There we go. Um, I'd say for me, a big bonus of having a boom that's too long is um, you've got a pre-made, really nice place to put your camera on the back of the boom there. Great shot of these heroes out on the trapeze. With some custom sunnies on there because they're cooler than everybody else. There we go. I hope that helps. There we go. All right. So um, continuing, Declan says, just tell us where to write to qualify your record. Will do. Thanks, man. Uh, Mike, by the way, is in BC. What's that? British Columbia. Would that be Canada? Sorry, my knowledge of um, Canadian geography is lacking somewhat. <laughs> All right. And Declan says, Phil, you did an epic job, particularly with those sticky new fixed jib cleats on the new global standard Hobie 16. OK. And Steve says, Joe, what top speed are you aiming for? I think in the future. You see, we started using this year uh, at the Wildwind Beach, the Velocitech Speed Puck GPS 
which gives you an average speed over 10 seconds. I think the next big hurdle to get to would be to get an average over 10 seconds of uh, 26 knots. That will be absolutely cooking. But what that requires is to have um, very strong but stable wind, not too gusty. Because when uh, myself and Phil put in the big speed, the thing that made the difference was, yes, it was very windy, but there were gusts which were long. So it wasn't like the gusts were like just for a second or two. The gusts were holding for a long time, which meant the boat had to, enough time to pick up speed and start kind of gliding. Uh, whereas if you're just getting short gusts, the boat starts to pick up speed, but never has the chance to really reach its potential. So I'd say top speed is out there. And this is what I've been saying for years. It is out there. It sounds a bit far fetched, but I think 27 knots is out there. I can't even believe I'm saying that because only five years ago, um, the fastest I'd ever been was 23 and a half. Um, so I think it is out there and I think I'm ready. Mm, that's why you retire from your job, from your day job, so that you can try to go at 27 knots. There we go. All right. ABR says, uh, uh, just had an article where um, a small area of unprotected area will corrode faster than if the entire area was exposed. There we go. All right, we got Scott dropping it in the slot. Uh, he says hello to Joe in the Joyrider community. Great to have you with us, Scott. Um, all right, so ABR says, any idea what is inside the roto molded wave holes that the hardware is? bolted to are the bolts glued or located in place any techniques for getting them loose mm. no um to be honest i don't know what the inside of um those roto molded molded holes are doing but what i would guess is where it's molded there's a small hole for where the bolt goes in and then on there'd be a massive lump of reinforcement with a threaded um kind of like a bolt on the inside um if they feel like they're absolutely seized um but you have to get them out what i would always do to get something like that out is get the biggest adjustable spanner or wrench um that you can and get it on there and just gently nudge it to um, see if you can get that moving. Um, but there's always the risk, especially if it's getting quite old, then um, that when you're trying to move it, it might actually snap off. But I've had some success in the past of, of then when I've snapped a bolt off, like we actually had a bolt snap by being hit by another boat, drama. Um, of actually drilling down that old bolt and re-tapping uh, the thread uh, for the new bolt to go into. So it depends how much you want to get those bolts out. There we go. All right. So where are we up to? How are we doing in the preloaded? That's good. Preloaded. Tick. Uh, live chat. I think tick. So I think um, we might leave it there for today. I think if everybody is um, is happy, uh, Leland Lee says, come down to Florida during hurricane season. You'll break it for sure. You'll certainly break something, I'm sure. All right. So thanks to everybody for tuning in today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this scintillating Q&A. Don't forget, I won't let you forget because I'll make sure that it's very well advertised. The Show Us Your Cat return on Sunday 
So make sure you check that out. I'll do it as a premiere. So there will be some live chat uh, like this available at that point. And, um, and off we go. So see you on Sunday with Show Us Your Cat. Otherwise, if you're going out sailing this weekend, get on the speed stick if you're not on there already or beat your previous speed if you can. Um, join the Discord server. You'll find the link to that in the uh, any of the descriptions of any of the videos. And uh, have a great weekend. And thank you very much. And I'll see you soon with some more. As always, hit the like button as well, if you could. Thank you.